What's going on, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Willing Ass Startups podcast, where today's episode is not a startup. I know. We got Trey, we got Trey Lowe with uh, a small company called Devon out of Oklahoma. You might have heard of them. Uh, funny thing, yesterday, you guys had somebody scale your tower. Yes, we did. And I also didn't realize how big y'all's tower was until I saw it on the news. I was like, man, this looks way bigger than in the pictures. That's absolutely terrifying for me to imagine not being tethered to a building and then just scaling it. But apparently he made it to the top and then. Yeah, th- thank goodness. Got to right. get a reward for yeah. being arrested. I was in, in Houston, uh, so flew down a couple of days ago, but I was actually speaking at a conference yesterday. And thank goodness I left my phone like sitting out in the in the audience. When I got back to my chair, I had a dozen text messages and like 20 teams messages. And I was like, do you have any like, pictures from the inside of like happened? this guy? Like, yeah, like our team. so um, pictures from the, well, pictures obviously taken from the inside, but also like pictures taken from the inside that have come all the way around social media and then back. And it's like your friends, like what is going on? So, but uh, no, I. Thank, I mean, thankfully he made it to the top and, you know, he has a, his own mission and thing he's, uh, he's trying to, to accomplish. And my understanding, he's done this before. And, okay. And was uh, this just like, know, I want to climb tall buildings or was this like, a, I'm trying to bring awareness to something? He's trying to bring awareness, um, to, uh, to social issues. So that, okay. that are important to him, but, um, you know, thank, thank goodness for our emergency responders in Oklahoma yeah. city. You know, they all showed up, kind of kept, kept people safe and, you know, at least manage the situation as best we could. But so, yeah, it, it got everyone's attention. I'm, I'm sure productivity in the building kind of came to a halt, yeah, like yeah. all of that was going on, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm thankful it all worked out. I had the opportunity to, to, I know a guy who does th- things like that. Like that's his thing. Like yeah. he goes on, he's like, his whole Instagram is him scaling buildings and then like he'll, whether they're occupied or they're abandoned or whatever. And we go, um, we go with a group of friends and I had never met them. We go to a concert and then afterwards they're like, Hey, we're going to go, we're going to go climb this building. And I was like, uh, I got kids for one, <laughs> two, that sounds terrifying. Yeah. And illegal, um, and illegal at the same yeah, time. And I'm like, yeah. ah. I'm gonna let you guys have this one. I'm just gonna I'll watch it on watch it on Instagram. But no, this this was something for sure that Devin uh, did not condone, and you know, it, yeah. it, I think it took the it took the entire company by surprise. Like, what is going on? But um, anyway, it's uh, quite quite the way to start the week. Could you sure. imagine that guy would have fell? Oh my lord, I, that would have been. I'm terrifying. trying not to. In fact, uh, I, I think we were all really nervous about yeah. that. Not, I yeah. mean, not just for his that individual sake, but just uh, all of the witnesses that would yeah, come on. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, rough. thankfully it worked, it, it worked out. I know the, the authorities were there to take him into custody when he, when he safely reached the top, but man, what a, what a, what a way. Yep. So we got so much to talk about. We pretty much did a whole podcast before we even turned on record. Uh, so your chief technology officer. That's right. Devin, how long have you been yeah. there? Uh, I've worked at Devin 16 years, but okay. it's been like probably a lot of your guests and like you, it's been kind of kind of a wandering yeah. wandering path to get there, yeah. and I've had this role for about three years now. So okay. yeah, I lead all of uh, Devin's kind of digital efforts. So that would okay. include IT, um, what companies would call OT, like operational technology, SCADA, sensor systems, mm-hmm. um, and all the data science and all the kind of data stitching that happens in between all of those systems. So that's that's in my organization. Interesting. Like, yeah. do you have like a, in that role? Is there like a north star that you're working towards in terms of? Like, hey, this is what we want to accomplish from a technology perspective at Devon? Uh, 100%. Um, so we, we as a company want to differentiate our operations using technology. And so that for us, that means that we're going to invest in, think of your drilling, your completion, subsurface technology, yeah. production technology. So the things that have our core business, we're going to have basically software development teams. We're going to be pushing the edge. We're going to be right out at the tip of the pointy spear trying to, uh, to be a leader in those spaces. Mm-hmm. And so that's how we uh, keep aligned. That's how we prioritize our projects. And then, you know, all of the things you would traditionally think of like your commercial, maybe back office applications and stuff like that, we are resistant to, to go all in on that stuff. And we try to uh, limit customization and kind of proprietary stuff, but Mm -hmm. that's how we think about it. But it's ultimately driving our core business. And, and that's my background. I'm an engineer by background. And so I came through kind of the completions and production ranks up through our company and, uh, and so still I know like all the field guys and I know kind of, you know, what's happening on the ground, you know. So was this like it's, accidental? Was this just like, you're just, you're just rolling with the punches and you just so happen to have a knack for technology over the years. And there was like, oh, we're just going to keep giving you more uh, technology no, responsibility. It, yeah. So I was always, I mean, everybody knows that that guy on the team who loves the new thing, you yeah. know? And so that was, that was probably me for a long time. And 
I was one of those hobbyist technology folks who's, you know, on the weekend learning how to write some code or, you know, playing out with the new whatever technology was was at the time, whether it was, you know, cell phones or if it was uh, HTML or uh, drones or, you know, all of these things uh, over time. And so I had a navigation to that. And uh, even when I started moving into leadership, I was a champion for the company and all of kind of our technology efforts mm-hmm. in a way. And and this was a place where I where I, I you know, I talked about all the ways we could improve enough that they finally said, OK, all right, you're in charge. You, you go make it better. And so uh, <laughs> but it's, it's been great, man. This is like my uh, New York Yankees job. It's yeah. uh, a lot of fun for me. And I don't know, man, I'm. I see something new and I get charged up for like weeks on end and mm-hmm. my team knows it, but, uh, you know, I go to a conference like I'm at this week and I'm going to come back with like a dozen ideas yeah. and they're like, all right, everybody be prepared. we got to, you know, put our filter up. What are you, what are you excited about awesome. right now? Uh, I'm excited about what we're doing on the, on the data side. Okay. I think, um, so stitching together, like everything from the sensors in the field or even like mail coming into the building and mm-hmm. digitizing that, mm-hmm. putting it into basically a, a river of data that all along the way can be used. It can be aggregated, used, analyzed, and make decisions all the way from the lease operator mm-hmm. in the field, all the way up to the executive committee trying to make capital decisions. And just, I don't know, just spinning that out to make better decisions, go faster, uh, automating like really complex work sets so that somebody can do something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I'm excited about that. And then there's a bunch of stuff around the corner that's going to be cool. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's going to be cool. Well, what, what, what can you tease? What, what can you talk uh, about? I, th- I think low orbit satellites are going to be interesting um, for all of the communications challenges. We've low had. orbit satellites. So what, how much how much lower are we talking? Are we talking just so, barely outside the atmosphere? Yeah. So think Starlink. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah. a good example. Yeah. It would, that's the one everyone knows because of uh, my dad just got Starlink. Actually, yeah. at so, the, he just retired, so moved to the ranch, and we haven't had internet out there since like forever. And I would always, you know, badger him. I was like, Dad, I can't come. Out. I can't. I can't get any work done. You know, how am I gonna get work done on the weekends? And so he retired, finally moved up there, and like week one was just like, I need internet. And turns out there's not Starlink in their area, but him and his redneck buddy figured out that they could use the satellite that's for Oklahoma and reroute it to the ranch or whatever. And now he's got great internet. So, so all of the the rigs that run in, you know, Southeast New Mexico or out uh, outside of Gillette, Wyoming. And Mm -hmm. um, it takes a big investment to put up towers, to go, you know, beam the internet basically to a, to a rig or to a well site that's going to be down in a valley. And so, um, so I'm excited about that high speed internet, low, it's low orbit. So it's low latency. Mm -hmm. So the things we want to do with video and other stuff in the field, we'll be able to do that in the future. So. So is That's it still, cool. is it still the same? I mean, I haven't actually been out to the field in like a technology capacity in greater part of a decade. And so back then it was obviously there was just no connectivity practically anywhere that we went. Is that still the case or are there other solutions out there? No, I mean, it's gotten way better. So yeah. way better. Both um, commercial systems have gotten better. You know, think of your kind of uh, proprietary systems. There's some big ones in the Permian Basin now that cover almost all of the footprint. Um but in other places, we still have challenges. Uh, but even like at uh, Devon locations, they almost all have Wi-Fi on them now. So, mm. uh, I mean, we've put in a huge investment so that we have high-speed internet basically everywhere. And mm. so we're on a path where we put cameras out there. And we're on a path where we have, you know, the internet of things, or all these buzzwords you've heard about. For it. It's, it needs that connectivity. And so yeah. uh, so it's changing for sure. You guys, are you guys going heavier on edge devices? Uh, almost everything has an edge device, but yeah. you know, the real question or the leading question is like, are we doing anything there? Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, have you put some algorithm at the edge and it controls, uh, we're not there yet. The industry is yeah. not there yet in yeah. the United States. Um, yeah. we have the capability and I think everybody has that vision, but, uh, but we're still a lot of the, the things that we could put at the edge, the pace of the decision that's made. So like, if you're going to make a fast decision, you got to have something at the edge. And so think of like frack jobs. Uh, so if you're on a pump in a frack, looking at a screen out. I mean, that happens like really fast and we're not going to be able to make automated decisions in the, in the cloud or in the office on stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, but that's harder to, but like in the production environment, we might make a decision once a day or a few times a day. And mm-hmm. so that would be simpler, put it at the edge, but you don't really need it at the edge. You know, it, um, we're going to have communications that can yeah. help us on that. So anyway, so that's kind of where we are. We were, we were talking about before we started recording, um, just kind of like the, the data problem. Right. I, I love nerding out. That's how I came into the industry was was looking to solve that issue uh, for EMPs. I think arguably it's, it's worse off now in, in a lot of ways than it was even uh, a decade ago. And I think that's just, you know, we're just adding so many new technologies, new startups are popping out and I love it. It's tons of innovation and stuff. But then it, for, for you guys, it's like, how do we 
it's like, it's like opening the fire hose, you know, how do you, how do you make sense of that? So I'm curious, like, how do you guys think about data management? How do you think about what you capture, you know, what is driving those decisions? Is that something that comes down from management saying we need visibility into something you should start capturing this? Or is it, you know, the different business units saying, hey, we need something around here? Or is it just like, hey, we have all of this. Let's see what's available to us. Like, I don't like, where do you start? It, you know, we, we started a long time ago. So about 10 years ago, some of my, my predecessors honestly had um, the foresight to say, man, this is going to be really important. We better start organizing now. Mm -hmm. um, we better start you know, and there was a whole movement at the time to have data management, data stewards in organizations, the data governance councils. There was a whole there was a whole thing uh, kind of around that to start organizing your data, figuring out, you know, if we call something in one part of the business, it's going to be the same thing in the other part of the business. And so we started that in earnest about 10 years ago. Um, where we are today, I wouldn't say we have a problem uh, with data. I think it's a I think it's wonderful. Honestly, I'd rather have too much of this data than be missing something and black hole and then you're back yeah. shooting from the hip and making gut decisions on stuff. So I think we're in a great place, but it's a lot of work. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Keeping all of that squared away, joining things. We, uh, Devin moved like our entire environment to the cloud a few years ago. And so mm -hmm. it helps us just yeah. being there. It helps us kind of scale up and manage mm -hmm. all of it, but it's still a lot of work. But how, how big is the technology organization that you run? Um, we're about 180 people. 180. Yeah. Wow. So, man. um, and once again, that's kind of all of what you traditionally think core IT all the way through software development and, and kind of everything in between. So, but yeah, we manage, we manage all of that today. Um, you know, when you think about like what's coming now, think, um, for example, we've got new requests pretty regular for regulatory reporting for environmental needs, emissions monitoring. And it's mm -hmm. like, all right, we never collected those data points that are going to be required for this. Now you got to start backing up all the way into the steps. So like, all right, how are we going to go get the data? How do you join it or transform it? Where do you store it? And then how do you visualize it? Mm -hmm. So regulatory so, reaches out and say, hey, I, I don't have this report that I need. I don't have this data point. So they come to you, put in a request, and you you guys reverse right. engineer this and figure it out. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll, work, we'll work all the way back to the chain. And almost always anymore in our organization, like the person who is the consumer of the data isn't the same or organizational component that's actually going to have to generate or make or put the sensor out there. And so... So yeah, we try to be the glue on on all of those things, but uh, Dev, Devin's super collaborative, so that that usually works really well for us. So speaking of that, like we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, how do you how do you make that decision to buy something or build something? You said you guys build a, a significant amount kind of internally. How do you like how do you how do you like walk me through that? Unpack that. Like, what's that decision making process like? Um. I don't know. If you think about it, like a, a every decision is unique for us. There's some that are that are easy no's. Um, and but if we get into a place that we think it will differentiate our business, it's going to be you know production related. For example, that's core to our business. That's where we make our money. Um, we'll very quickly start uh, looking at what's available in the market. And uh, we're like I said at the pointy end of the spear. Lots of times, and there's just not things that meet our needs. And so. Uh, real quickly, we get in a decision mode. Do we want to wait because others are going to need this thing eventually, mm -hmm. or do we want to go build it ourselves? And we have a team there that can can prioritize and and build out whatever need that we have, whatever capability that we're trying to build. And but that's usually the final decision point. Do we wait? Do we build it ourselves and pay for the cost of both software development and sustain it? So once we build mm -hmm. it, now it's we're it's we're on the hook because yeah. uh, if anything, in in a company with all of this data. Uh, ripping something out and replacing it with something else means you got to stitch together all of those uh, mm -hmm. kind of systems around it. But do you guys have full stack devs? Uh, on? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So we'll have we'll have you know we're I would say a very progressive, pretty modern software development uh, organization. So we run teams as DevOps teams or multiple. You know they're multi they're integrated disciplines, both data science, software development, business analyst. You know, SMEs or kind of the experts or I'll be, I'll be on the team together, kind of, you know, just like y'all's combo on board that you yeah, have out yeah. here, you know, they're, they're working through kind of DevOps, uh, agile workflows and, and kind of rolling out software over time. So I don't know, honestly, I would have said three years ago, if you asked me like, what are you, what are you going to be good at? I'd say the software development, mm -hmm. but my uh, opinion has changed and it's to that data side. I think we're. Where a company like us, we have to be good is stitching together all of those data sets. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, you'll see like in my organization, even we're shifting resources to get better 
at data ops to figure out how do we get faster of delivering those kind of data solutions and taking all of these disparate software packages, putting them together so that somebody can make a better decision with it. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's kind of what we're thinking about. I mean, the, so let's, let me play devil's advocate a little bit because, you know, there's a, lots of startups come and sit where you're at every single week. And one of their favorite things to say on and off camera is, um, you know, oil and gas companies should just produce oil and they should be building software. Right. I hear it every single week sounds to me like what you're saying is that you guys are so bleeding edge that there's just nothing out there that solves the need and so you have to you have to build it if you want to continue to stay as progressive as you guys like uh yeah Uh, i I mean not to talk at either end of the spectrum right so Mm -hmm. i would still say 80 to 90 percent of the things that we do and the software we use is all commercial all of the startups that that you get to come through your door, which are all wonderful companies, and I know I know many many of them, um, we're using them, and uh, we're 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 trying to kind of implement that and put it in our system. It's those gaps where um, maybe somebody hasn't filled it yet, um, mm-hmm. or it's a place where it's really difficult to integrate someone else's solution just to start with. Um, th- those are the gaps yeah. where we, where we usually build our own stuff, and so even a lot of our software development is small web apps um, or heavy integration work, Mm -hmm. building out really complex, stitching together our ERP system with our SCADA system and kind of all of the HR where people are going to sit systems. Uh, They're big data integration projects. And so that's usually where we end up with that decision tree to build ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I I get it, man. Yeah. And there's some smart folks. We love the startup world, honestly. They're going to move faster than we can too which is awesome. And they're going to learn faster, right? So they're going to have lots of customers. They're going to be getting lots of ideas. And so anyway, I'm more power to them. We, I mean, like you said, you guys, like, prior, to, prior to recording, you, you mentioned all the work that you guys are doing with Altera. And Altera, as I understand it, you know, Denver-based VC firm, it's my understanding the LP, there's like nine or 10 LPs that are EMPs. You were one of so them. So there's, there's four, in the, there's in, four? The, in the last fund. Okay. Yeah, we're us, uh, Pioneer Resources, Apache, and EQT. In fact, okay. or, in, or in the last fund, and so um, that's been that's been great. And so we get a, tons of exposure. We've had, you know, they predominantly look for technology companies, or at least uh, kind of technology uh, based companies. And so there's there's several of those. You've probably I don't know talked to some of their founders, mm-hmm. I would bet as yeah. well. But uh, but yeah, that's been that's been a great funnel for us to find new ideas. And then once we're an investor in a company, helping with both make that communication great for just product development, like hey, that's junk, that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Or that's something you should double down on has been a wonderful relationship for us. How, did, how does that relationship with, I had a conversation with somebody who was, who was uh, very involved um, when they were at Apache uh, with, the, with everything with Altera. How does that, does it, is there like a forum to where like you four companies sit down and say, hey, here's all the challenges that we're dealing with. Now Altera has at least some direction to kind of go out and try to scout these technologies. Or is it more so, hey guys, we found some really, really cool widgets. Do you guys have this problem that solves that? And then we'll kind of make our investment decisions maybe based off that. Uh, so Altier is great. Altier, the the group is wonderful. We've had a long relationship with them. I've known them for many years, but uh, it's both of those in a way. And so like every, we're just now uh, finishing up, basically we've used all of the funds for their, what was their fund six. And so they're about to restart fund seven with another group of strategic partners. And so it'll be us and another group of operators in the next fund. But they're sitting down with all of us saying, what's important to you? What are your priorities? What are the gaps now? Um, whether it's environmental or is it, you know, you need a new laser drilling bit or just whatever thing that they can go kind of hunt down. And then over time, they'll bring us other things that are kind of off of the off the chart. But every month we sit down, we go through new companies with them. And at least once a quarter, if not every six months, we'll have a shark tank with pitch day with a whole bunch of kind of startups. And, and that's interesting as well. Like the startups will come in, they'll pitch their company, tell you what's great about it. Almost always one or two of the strategic partners have tried them. And so, you know, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll leave and then it's like Shark Tank. You know where the sharks are kind of talking which, about. The which company. shark are you? Uh, I, I'm not going to say. Are you, it. Did, are you they, did, they, Are you Mr. Wonderful? They have called me Mr. <laughs> Wonderful, but I hate okay. I hate the uh, nickname, so I'm uh, <laughs> staying away from it. But anyway, you're not going to make any money on this. Mm-hmm. That's you right. Quit, that, you, that's quit right. what you're doing now. The, I, I don't know. I love that world. I love thinking about uh, you know just software as a service, the business model. Just kind of thinking about it. I don't know. It stretches your brain a little bit for an oil and gas person, but it, it's that's a lot of fun for us. No, yeah. that sounds that sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. And though. the investments have been great. To be honest, almost all of those companies that that Altera invest in. So it's usually something the strategic partners, three or four of the four um, have lined up and said, yeah, this is something we're using. It's going to be great. 
And so it's a pretty good leading indicator that they're going to be successful, at least with a product market fit. Does, does, so, does that collaboration between these four partners kind of ex, extend beyond just these these pitch meetings and these kind of... Uh, it does. It's what you would expect. You build relationships with your counterparts. And then next thing you know, you're like, hey, we've got this challenge. Have you ran across anything that works in that? And so we're still competitors, um, yeah. obviously, but being able to build relationships with your peers at really some of the most influential kind of independence has, has been super helpful for, for me in my career. And I'm sure for them, they'd say the same thing. So, I mean, I mean, really the thing about how valuable it is if you're about to try, you know, new Acme widget and yep. somebody over here at Apache was just like, Oh dude, we, we spent a billion dollars on it and it was terrible. You know, yeah. like just yeah. think about how valuable that yeah. is. And there, there's other forums for that too, but it's when you got skin in the game, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it makes it a yeah. little bit more real if, if yeah. that makes sense. So yeah, it's been good. What, what would you say are like some of y'all's, biggest challenges, whether it's today or whether it's in like two to five years, like what, what do you see kind of on the horizon? Um, some of the things that we're, we're working on today. So, um, we're going to lower our emissions over yeah. time. And so that's important to us. And that's in that kind of time frame. we're going to get better every year. And so there's two big efforts right now in, in that space on the technology front. And one, we are trying to figure out the best ways to do continuous monitoring at our well sites. So mm -hmm. how do we get like, just like you would with production, the, you know, flow rate big, sensors. Big question, right? right? So, so how many we, sensors, where? Exactly. Like, so we, we've got a test site out in Western Oklahoma and we've tested lots of different technologies, trying to understand, bringing it in, how do we make decisions around it? Um, and then the other one is the carbon accounting side. So mm -hmm. like, how do you, just like you track your dollars and revenue through a system, like how are we tracking carbon uh, emissions, CO2, methane emissions? How do we aggregate those across our facilities so that we can run sensitivities? We understand how things are changing over time and, and improve. And so uh, both of those are, are big challenges for us and, um, and continuing to get better. The other stuff is, uh, I wouldn't, I'd never call it a challenge. It's fun. It's like all of that kind of foundational work we did over the years, we're finally getting to have some fun with. And so mm -hmm. you see like data science and uh, algorithms being applied to like thousands of wells at a time. And so that's, it's cool, man. Uh, yeah. We're making huge, uh, huge steps uh, of improvement right there right now. So, and we will for the next couple of years, just kind of working on that stuff. And you guys are continuing to grow too. I mean, you got to look at, we're right off the back of the, uh, the WPX merger. I mean, yeah. I imagine that was pretty transformative for you guys. That yeah. pretty much what double head count, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. So that was a merger of equals. Uh, we didn't double head count. Okay. Um, so WPX was, uh, headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then Devon was headquartered in Oklahoma city, Oklahoma. And so we ended up with a headquarters in Oklahoma city, kept the Devon name. Um, but it was a merger of equals. Our executive team was kind of half and half, uh, from, from each company, um, and then, you know, we kept all of those field offices and all those field groups and, uh, we grew a bunch in, in that time frame. And really we closed that deal in January of last year. And so it's been almost 18 months, okay. uh, kind of in that time frame, And it's been, it's been awesome. And, mm -hmm. uh, commodity prices have been high. So we've had wind in our sales, but, um, the share prices has, has done great. Our performance has been amazing. And in all of those synergies that we had playing the capture, whether it was drilling costs coming down or being able to kind of improve GNA, LOE, all of those metrics were, mm -hmm. were our targets. We've basically met. And so I don't know, it's, it's definitely put, put, put the mer mergers can be hard with just culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's good whenever every, when it works out mm -hmm. and, and that's what we've experienced so far. Not that it's perfect. And yeah. there's definitely, you know, you've got, you got those cultures and feelings and people had to quit doing it their way. And now you got to do it the new way type stuff. And so we, we still have a few of those lingering, but um, overall that part's been great. And then we just announced an acquisition uh, last week. Yeah. Rimrock, so, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, Rimrock up in, in North Dakota. And uh, we've got a wonderful field team up in North Dakota. Uh, this will uh, give them some more wells and some more assets uh, to kind of to bolt on, you know, to, to the assets that we have. And we got a great subsurface and team to, to kind of go work it and figure out what the opportunity is. So you guys so are primarily in Oklahoma and North Dakota, right? No, actually yeah. our uh, primary operations are in uh, Southeast New Mexico and just right across really? the Texas okay, state line uh, in the Delaware basin. And so about 80% of our kind of capital and our activity is in the Delaware basin right now. And so We've also got uh, Mid-Continent, which operates basically Western Oklahoma. That's your mm -hmm. stack field. Yep. Um, we've got a position in the Eagleford. Mm -hmm. We've got a position in Powder River Basin in Wyoming and then North Dakota. And uh, But the predominant uh, activities in, in the Delaware. I'm, I'm curious. And I know this is like maybe a little outside the scope of what you normally talk about. But, you know, obviously you, you, 
EMPs have different business models and a lot want to be like a pure player in, say, the Permian or a pure player in the Bakken, right? right. And mm -hmm. it seems like you guys are kind of spread out. I didn't really know that, actually. Which is it just good rock is good rock and we'll just get good at it? Is that, uh, is that kind of the... I mean, good. we've got great people for sure. Yeah. And, we, and we do have good rock in all of these places. But I think it's part of our strategy to have options and it's mm -hmm. part of our strategy to be in multiple basins. And so if if we have issues, supply chain, land, legal, whatever issues may pop up in our business, this gives us optionality. And I think many of our leaders have been in the business through a few cycles. And it's like today's greatest play is not always tomorrow's greatest play. Mm -hmm. And so this this gives us some kind of options. And uh, we love the basins we're in. The Rock's great, obviously. The, and uh, the formations in the Delaware are uh, extremely prolific. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's why there's so many rigs running yeah. down there for sure. Um, but even the plays and, and the resource base that's in the powder – what we have in the Eagleford, the Bakken, I mean, all of them are, are kind of world-class uh, reservoirs at different stages in their life. But that's kind of how we think about it. It just gives us, it gives us options of what we want to mm -hmm. do. If we, if we need to grow production one day, we have places to go put the rigs. Yeah. And so that'd be fun. Are you guys running rigs now? I'm sorry? Are you running rigs now? Yeah. No, no we've got, um, we've got, like I said, the predominant of our activity in, in the Delaware, we're going to have some rigs running in Western Oklahoma in the stack play again. Uh, we'll have a rig running in the Powder River Basin and then Williston. And so, and then our position in the Eagleford uh, BPX actually does the drilling and completions that we take over at the producing side. Okay. Um, so we're 50, 50 partners in that one, but yeah, no, we're running lots of rigs, uh, lots of frack crews. Uh, we're busy. I love, uh, I love to hear it. We're busy. We're not growing production organically. Yeah. And so that's been pretty clear. Our strategy and our, so we're just, from, just baseline. How much, how much are you guys are producing a day? So we're at close to 600 BOEs per day. Okay. Um, and, you know, what we've committed to and what we're, we're holding to is uh, basically as a flat to 5% uh, kind of production profile, 5% growth production profile. And so we're, okay. we're not out like we were, you know, 10 years ago trying to grow at 10% per year type of uh, environment. But, um, but we're, tr we're maintaining production and continuing to try to get better and do it. It's good to hear. It's good yeah. to hear off the backside of yeah. uh, of yeah. the last few years. Yeah. Of, you know, the boom yep. and bust of, of of shale, and you know us just drilling commodity prices right yeah. in the ground. Yeah, well, are you guys predominantly oil? Um, it's a mix. Yeah, so I don't, I don't remember the exact uh, mix, Jake. So it's probably fifty fifty or close. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just uh, that, I think that's how you would describe us, depending yeah. on if you're talking about revenue generation or BOEs. But it's probably in that range. Yeah, I don't know the exact mix. So one of the, one of the things that I've been spending I spent my morning doing was arguing with people in the comments on Instagram about uh, somebody posted something about. Oh, this uh, sounds like a good use of time. Yeah, yeah. oil and gas companies. <laughs> uh, no, it was specific to Exxon yep. Mobil. It was like Exxon Mobil's. Uh, you know, Biden made his his comment about um, you know Exxon Mobil is making more money than God, and you look at their their net profit margins actually less than like eight percent uh, over the last year. The margins actually gotten slimmer as commodity prices have actually gone up, and so I'm in the comments just arguing with people, and um, <laughs> I'm just like I'm like you realize that oil and gas companies don't set the prices right, and uh, yeah, it's just been an interesting it's been an interesting morning. Yeah, that's. Uh uh, it's not how I'm going to spend my time, Jake. No, I promise, man. I know, the, I know, the, uh, I know. The social media comment section is, is uh, where I try to. It's a cesspool. I, I, try, to, I try to avoid at all costs. Don't go there. Uh, but right. I will say it does feel good. You know, my almost my entire career has been in a downturn until like this last year. Yeah. Obviously, we saw the worst of it yeah. kind of, you know, during 2020. So does, how does how, morale like uh, morale's, morale's good now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's been, I mean, not to discount the last uh the six years prior to that were were tough for sure for yeah. all for all of us. Um, we got smaller like a lot of independents did, mm -hmm. um, and and that a lot of people left uh, during that time frame, and they didn't want to leave, and we didn't want them to leave, but it was just the nature of it. But morale's great now. Yeah. I mean, everybody, uh, as you would expect in our business, we're growing again. You know, we're hiring a few people here and there. We're able to work on projects that we had shelved for a long time, and so people have their kind of passions that they're able to kind of dedicate some time to again. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's good. I mean, uh, I think people are generally happy. How, how is uh, attracting talent, like top tier talent, whether it be like, uh, like you know, petroleum engineers or whether it be, you know, devs, you know, that are going to be working under you. How, how is that? I know here in Houston, it's really hard to find like really good developers who especially want to go like do the startup life. Um, locally, you've got, um, at least there for a while, there was a coding boot camp next door in the, in the building next door. Um, they would hire EOG would hire every 
developer that went out of there. And so nobody could scoop up this talent. It was, it was, and now you got Combo Curve, we're friends with these guys. Yep. They just raised a ton of money. Now they're going and just poaching every developer in the city. Um, so it's hard. It's like really hard to find uh, like really, really good talent. Obviously there's the the challenge of uh, perception, you know, that we are battling. Um, I try to spend a good amount of time talking with either, you know, students that are trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, or maybe they're, um, you know, maybe they want it, they want to pursue energy, but they're just a little on the fence that they just don't know. And so people think that this is like this dying industry, but we're, we're growing. I feel like we're stronger than ever. I'm just kind of curious, like, how has that been for you? Is, has it been easy? Has it been a challenge? So I think there's, there's two stories. There's the petroleum yeah. engineer, petroleum geologist, which is a, a different market than your just generalized tech, tech worker, whether it's a data scientist or software developer, um, data engineer. And so those are, those are two different, two different things. I can see a future. Well, today hiring is out of those two worlds, still quite a bit easier if you're hiring a petroleum engineer or geologist. There's still a lot of people that left over the last four or five years that are wanting to come back into the industry. And so mm -hmm. you can, uh, every time we post a position, you know, there's lots of applicants in that space. Now, on software development, data science, data engineers, it's a completely different story. Just I mean, I mean competing uh, with like half a million dollar base right. salaries at Amazon plus another half a million dollar bonus. That's right. Plus now this, I'm curious where you guys are at with the whole work from home thing. So our, our attrition, thankfully, has been really low. Okay. Um, so that's great. Uh, that's great news. At least we're not backfilling or trying to fill to fill positions, but we have lost employees to you know count at your Microsofts, your Amazons, your Squares, you, uh, kind of down the list of all of these tech companies because the world changed. Now they can stay living in Oklahoma City and go work for a West Coast Silicon Valley company. Um, we're having to adjust to that. I think we were on the tech side really open to remote work before, and COVID just cemented that, especially now that we're trying to recruit good top talent. I mean, we need to be able to hire from Texas, and we need to be able to hire from folks that live in Austin or different parts of the of the country um, to get the skills that we need. Is it, is it hard to get people to relocate to, to Oklahoma? Uh, generally speaking, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, I mean, Houston's a hard sell too. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, like, I mean, the cities are very, very similar in, in a lot yeah. of ways. We do have an influx of people, I'd say, move into the middle part of the country. <coughs> and so we benefited from that. But yeah, asking somebody who lives in New York city to come work for us in, in Oklahoma is, is a harder sell. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about it. So we're now that we're, you know, we are very open to, to like fully remote work. Uh, it just broadens our funnel and our net that we can go capture some. What, some folks. What's what's the makeup of your team? Is it like 50, 50, half remote and half in office? I'm oh no, curious. we're still, we, well, we're still like leg, legacy dominated. I and mean, we hadn't had that much attrition to swap out completely. And, yeah. and we still have a predominant, the majority of our folks like coming to the office yeah. occasionally. I mean, those are social network as well. I hate uh, work from home to be honest with you. Yeah, I know so, that sounds like crazy, but I do. I like being around people, even as like an introvert, I, I like, I feed off the energy. I don't have to be the center of attention. I don't have to be in the conversations, but yeah. I like to be around people. And that really was solidified for me during COVID because I was just going crazy. I couldn't uh, see anybody. I could go out yeah. and like, especially yeah. the nature of what we do and the event stuff. Um, Lisa said we got five minutes. So right. I'm going to hit All some right. hard hitting questions. Right. Sounds good. Um, what you got? Hard hitting. What's hard hitting? Um, I guess let's, let's finish that. Let's finish that thought. Are there, are there any tips, tricks for the people who are remote? Like how do you, how have you guys like integrated them into your workflow and like make that successful? I'll say that for us, like we, we, we went kind of quasi remote, like a few, a few days a week remote. And then the rest of the week was in the, in the office. Um, before our last conference, we said, listen, work from home is ending, uh, because it's go time. And like, we were having some communication issues, right? right. Yep. So everybody came in the office, guess what? We knocked it out of the park and it was like amazing. And so now we were like pretty hard line, um, with the exception of like one person who lives in Austin and has since the beginning, you're going to be in the office. And I just feel like we have like really, really good communication and good collaboration and I don't know. I'm, I just, I'm just, I'm sure that a lot of other companies have like really struggled to like figure it out. Uh, for sure. We haven't figured it out. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say that we got it all nailed down for sure, <laughs> but there is no doubt some roles are easier to do fully remote than others. And even for teams like mine, we have a ton of internal customers. And if you're in a role that has to like interface with your internal customers all the day, you better have a strong relationship. And it's, yeah. uh, we're just culturally in a place that's easier to do if you're in person. And so mm -hmm. those are almost always going to be 
uh, predominantly uh, in the office, at least a few days a week so that you can go visit with them. And, you know, if they tell you everything's fine, you can ask, is that really fine? You know? Yeah. So, uh, and then we got some roles that, you know, even prior to COVID, you'd see them, you know, lights are off, headphones are on, and they're just freaking getting after it. Um, and we had a bunch of teams that had uh, dev support from India and overseas, and they had gotten in kind of structured, agile process. And so, uh, you know, people are getting their work done because it's chopped up in a little bits and you see it coming in the door all the time. Mm -hmm. And those groups have not missed a beat with having remote workers. And yeah. so, so for us, it's a little bit different depending on the role. Almost all of my leaders are really practiced at uh, kind of staying connected and yeah. building that kind of relationship and culture, even with their remote workers. But it's easier in the tech world. There's no doubt about it. You know, if you go to like our all, all the tools are already set up for it. That's right, know? and it's it's uh, it's culturally more normal, I would mm -hmm. say, than kind of your traditional petroleum uh, different domains. And so, yeah. uh, so even across our company, where we've got a mix a mixed bag and. I don't know. It's going to be interesting the next few years to figure out how it works. What's best? Is it is it back to like everybody needs to be in the office because it's go time? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, can we find some roles in a happy medium, flexible uh, workplace? And so, I don't know. We're going to learn a bunch, man. Yeah, I think it I, – I think – a big you see you see a lot of TikToks, you see a lot of Instagrams. I saw one this morning. A guy was like, "Oh, my work from home setup," and he's like, he's in a swivel chair, and he goes to the left, and it's like his gaming setup, and then he's like, "Oh, I got to answer some emails," and he like rotates over to his other his work computer. He's like answering emails. I just feel like it's this excuse. Like I see so many people on. Um, I'm just calling everybody out. I see people on Instagram like all day, like, "Oh, work from home," and it's like you're not working. Like you're not actually work. Like you're at the beach. You're not doing anything. This is not. <laughs> this is not work from home. And so I just feel like it's, it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I just come from a different time. I just feel like it's an excuse for people to like not work hard. And I'm not saying a blanket statement that that's everybody. It's just like the vibe that I get from this younger generation is like, ah, we don't want to work hard. We want to like work wherever we don't want to actually do work. I just want to travel around to Airbnbs and take pictures on, on the beach and send an email every once in a while. And it's like, I just have a hard time believing that. I'm I'm at a, I'm at a place so I don't I mean if they want to work from the beach we go for it I'll, I'll more power to you we've got we've got at least one employee that lives in Florida and you know he's out of kayak in the middle of the day type stuff but as long as they're getting the work done dude I mean yeah. they can work in the middle of the night they can work whenever but we're going to measure that work and we're going to hold them accountable yeah. to it and that, if that slips then that's a different conversation yeah. right? but um, we're doing our best to not say. You know, butt in seat equals work output. No, and, absolutely. And, and I so, totally, so, I totally so, agree with that. Too. So that's the other thing. I mean, you don't have to go f too far in corporate America. You walk down the hall and you see everybody's still on their Instagram, still on yeah. their Facebook, and, but you know, they've, they're in their office doing it. So yeah, like uh, we have pretty like minimal requirements in terms of like work hours. Um, we feel like we're pretty like progressive because it doesn't, it doesn't equal productivity just by sitting there. It's like, you're only actually productive. Yep. At least with what we do, especially creative stuff, like a few hours a day, <clears throat> but at the same time, if you got like, you got shit that's got to get done, you got to, you got to get shit done, you know? So, <laughs> well, Lisa's, Lisa's looking at me. She's giving me, she's giving me the hard, uh, we got to wrap this thing stuff. up. Yeah. So Trey, thank you for, yeah, thank appreciate you for coming the, yeah, on. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, sure, I, I would sure. love to, to come up. I, I literally had an idea as I'm sitting here, we should do like an MTV Cribs where we go to like different headquarters and you cool. guys just give me the tour. We'll bring some cameras along. Dude, our building's a work of art. It's, is it? Uh, it is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. You, I've seen some it. pretty cool yeah. ones. So maybe we'll do like a, maybe we'll do a ranking system. Ah, we we'll give you guys a, like an award for the best, the best office. That would be cool. Very cool. I'd, I'd love it. On the inside of the building. Inside okay. of the building. Yes. Absolutely. Maybe we'll do a field trip too. I'd love to go <laughs> see some wells too. Um, All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, the, what a great episode. Um, so if you take two, two seconds, leave us a rating review, share it with your friends, and we'll catch you guys on the next one.